Hi, welcome to my live stream. I apologize that I'm running a bit late today. I um, actually, my refrigerator broke. <laughs> And I was waiting for the repairman who came exactly at 12 o'clock. So, um, so anyway, he's, he's working on it now and he's going to let himself out so I can do this live stream. So thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, <clears throat> this idea of defining yoga and how it important it is for yoga teachers. You know, my, um, uh, I was talking to a friend who, hi Kitty, I was talking to a friend who um, has a, is a yoga teacher and has a nice Facebook group. And she was talking about how it's so difficult to, um, if you're not going to define yoga, then how can you know who you're supposed to reach? And I think that's such an important point. Like, how do you know who you're going to reach if you don't define what yoga is? And that doesn't mean it has to be the same for all of us. In fact, I think it's very different depending on who you are and what, you know, and who you're working with. Um, that doesn't mean that the traditional definitions of yoga aren't useful, right? Um, and, and not only aren't they not useful, but they're not important. Um, so I had a, um, a post, I put up a post yesterday on my page and I also put it up on uh, a couple of groups that I belong to and got such an outpouring of responses because it was a picture of myself with some of my students with our hands kind of like this. We were doing this kind of reaching for energy and then bringing it to the chakras um, move that I that I love. And um, it you know has to do with embodied cognition. It has to do with connecting to your higher power. It has to do with the energy body. You know, but what it doesn't have to do with is are your arms properly aligned in a mountain pose and properly externally rotate? Like that's not what I was teaching. So I had that picture up and the criticism was uh, the feet are disconnected from the hips and, and the arm, what are the arms doing? What are the, what are you teaching these people? Um, which was a powerful criticism of this powerful point, because the point was, how do you define yoga? So if you define yoga as, alignment of all the you know bones and joints then you're going to look at a picture of people doing things like this and go what the hell is that that's not yoga you know um so i it, it depends on where you're starting from right it depends on your side and so you have to unpack those definitions now this is useful for us as, in terms of yoga community but it's also particularly important for us uh it's particularly important for us in terms of our students because they need to know what we're doing, <laughs> what our point is and what we're teaching, right? Students need to know. Um, and, and so we can't, so, so I, I always tell my students in my training programs, you know, one time I remember seeing the sign on a, in the bakery or the grocery store and it said yoga for everybody. Sorry, that's my phone. It said yoga for everybody. And uh, my response to that is actually that's yoga for nobody. Because if you say something like that, yoga for everybody, you're, you know, that, that doesn't define, you're not defining who the people are that you work with. And frankly, like, unless you're, you know, some, some uh, enlightened master, really, and even the enlightened masters, this is true for uh, not everybody is going to vibrate or resonate on the same frequency that you're resonating on. And therefore we have to be clear about what we're offering. And in that clarity of what we are offering, people start to feel safer and also because they know what they're getting from you. And also they weed themselves out, which is great. You know, please weed out if you don't like doing this kind of movement with me, like, please, there are so many other yoga teachers that will help you, but I'm not the right person to help you with that. So, so I think that that part is, I think that that part is extremely important. And then, um, and, and so, so I spent this week, I had two meetings with, um, different, uh, yoga students of mine who are really interested in doing more with their yoga business. And, um, and so in both of those meetings, um, the the request from me was you know help me figure help me figure out what i'm offering you know and and that 
it took me a long time to do and it took me a long time to figure out who I wanted to work with and what I wanted to offer. And I'm pretty versatile now as a yoga teacher because I've been doing it for a long time and I've been studying for a long time. Nevertheless, it's still really important to get that real clarity. And even though it feels like, oh, I don't want to limit myself to not take those other people, it's the best thing you can do for yourself. It really is in terms of your business, in terms of your mental health, in terms of your sanity, in terms of moving your business forward to really have clarity about who who you want to work with and what you can do for that person. Um, and so in the marketing world, they call this your avatar, which is um, kind of a funny word, but, but I like that. I like the idea is like, I know exactly who I work with and what I can do for that person. And, and I think that's a, I, I, you know, just as a simple business strategy, that is the starting place. Because if you're going to talk about yoga for everybody, you are going to, you're going to miss, you know, you're going to miss so many people. Okay. So, so that was one thing I wanted to make sure I talked to, uh, talked about. And then I want to segue that into some of the stuff I was talking about a couple weeks ago in terms of um, uh, in terms of some traditional definitions of yoga and why they're important. So someone sent me, uh, when I put this up uh, the other day on Facebook, someone sent me a quote. And this quote, it's a lovely quote from Donna Ferry's book, Yoga, Mind, Body, and Spirit. Um, and what she's talking about here is a definition of yoga. So right, it's about defining yoga. So I think this is really important. So the quote was, yoga is not about self-improvement or making ourselves better. It's a process of deconstructing all the barriers we may have erected that prevent us from having an authentic conversation with ourselves in the world. This tenant is an extremely important one because the effort to change and improve ourselves is fraught with the risk of subtle self-aggression that only produces more unhappiness. We cannot strive towards something that we already are. Um, okay, so let me deconstruct this quote a little bit. I think it's a use, very useful and interesting quote. She talks about yoga not being about self-improvement. She talks about yoga being the deconstructing of barriers, which would be called the yoga in, uh, in Patanjali. So there's yoga and then there's the yoga means pulling the stuff apart so you can see more clearly. And she talks about we have to be really careful because if we think that yoga is about making ourselves better, then we have the risk of subtle self-aggression, which, wow, huge, right? We, we, all, we face that risk of thinking that there's something wrong with ourselves. And we cannot strive towards something that we already are. Now, it's a lovely quote, and this is how I disagree with that quote. <laughs> because my perspective comes from more of a, uh, this is a, this is coming from a Vedanta or a non-dual approach, right? So she's saying we cannot strive towards something that we already are. That's non-dualism. Beautiful. And um, my approach is more of a uh, dualistic non-dualism approach, which is Dwaita, Dwaita. But it's so confusing. So you don't have to worry about that so much. But but I will break it down to understand, to help you understand what I'm talking about by dualism. Okay. So Patanjali says that we have Purusha and Prakriti essentially within ourselves. This is also true in the, the traditions I've been trained in, which have more to do with um, Shaivism, uh, Kashmiri Shaivism and Gaudiya Shaivism. I, I'm more um, aligned with those traditions. Uh, and, and in those traditions, the idea is, and in many, many traditions all over the world, there's this dualistic idea. And Patanjali is a dualist also. This is how he differs from Vedanta. And that dualism is Purusha and Prakriti. There's Purusha, who is consciousness, and there's Prakriti, who is the dance, the, the, the manifested realm. And there's talk about how Prakriti dances in order to please Purusha. You know, you can get into all the gender stuff there. That's not what I'm talking about. But the idea is that this universe is created in all of its beauty and glory, uh, as a as an honorific um, um, sac a, a, a sacrifice, a, a uh, I don't want to use the word sacrifice. It's a, it's an honorific gift to Purusha in in a sense, right? Um, and or Shiva and Shakti. I'm much more interested in the Shiva and Shakti dynamic than the Purusha Prakti. They're very similar though, and they they have to do with this dualism. And Patanjali says 
that we all face kleshas that keep the veils of ignorance on us, right? And those kleshas have to do with things like being ignorant and um, too much sense of self, too much ego, um, being too attached to something or not liking something, right? Attachment or aversion. And then that clinging we all have, that clinging us to like, just keep everything the way that it is, right? So these are the kleshas. These are the things that, that cloud our vision, that cloud our awareness. And then we, the process of removing the veils is Kriya Yoga. And Kriya Yoga is Tapa, Swadhyaya, Ishvara, and, pra, uh, Swadhyaya and Ishvara Pranidhana, right? So it's sacrifice. It is um, uh, the, the, the capacity to look at yourself. And it is devotion to Ishvara. Ishvara is the form of the higher power that comes to each of us individually. It doesn't even matter if you're in the same religion. We all have a, a sense of Ishwara, that, according to Patanjali, right? And so in my opinion, yoga is holding the hand of Ishvara because you're like a child, you know, in so many ways we don't see the veils and Ishvara helps to re release them for us. So it's holding the hand, being guided and accepting that support. Ishvara Pranidhana essentially means accepting support from your higher power. And in the other hand, we hold our toolbox of yoga. And it's through the tools and the effort, and it's through the grace and the support that we then start to remove those glaciers and then start to remove the veils. So yes, in one sense, I totally agree with Donna Ferry and all the non-dualists that we already are this perfect being. But in the other sense, the, the dualistic, non-dualistic approach says, use your tools and use the support and together walk towards that place of love and support and kindness and oneness. Because that really is the, the goal of yoga. It's not so much um, about becoming perfect or self-improvement, but it is very much about opening up to the love that is available to us and, and very much about um, using the tools to help remove the veils of ignorance. That's my opinion. That's why I, I differ a little bit from Eckhart Tolle and some of the, uh, and the non-dualist um, perspective, you know, he's not even really a non-dualist, but, but he, but he is. <laughs> and, and some of that, um, ad, uh, some of that Advaita perspective, which is because I think the risk in that perspective is complacency. So the risk in the risk in the perspective of yoga being about self-improvement is subtle self-aggression. How you deal with the subtle self-aggression is realize you are the child of Ishwar. You are the child of the divine and who loves you more than anything that is possibly imaginable in your life. And that's the, that's what minimizes that risk of self, uh, of self-aggression. The risk of non-dualism, however, is just as great. And that is the risk of, of the ego uh, taking over and then accepting everything as it is and complacency. And, um, you know, and that's not just about complacency with ourselves, by the way, it's complacency with, with social justice issues. And that's why I think non-dualism is so powerful because it helps us walk on the path. It gives us a sense of love and support and we can use yoga. That's the toolbox you take with you on the path and use the tools as you need them. So I hope this is helpful. Um, I went a little bit longer than I expected. Oh, thank you all for being here and joining. By the way, I was looking at my notes. So um, so thank you. I, I, it's lovely to have people. It's lovely to have you all here. And thank you for your comments. I hope this is helpful. Um, and I, you know, here I went from talking about marketing yourself as a yoga teacher to some of the sublime uh, teachings from from the tradition, um, and I think that as, as when we carry these sublime treat teachings with us into our work, that's what makes our work authentic, powerful, personally transformative, transformative for for uh, the potential for transformation for our students and transformation. As long as it's in that uh, done in that. Um, within that spirit of, of love and of guidance and of, um, um, and, and of nurturing, then I think it's a beautiful process and doesn't have to include this idea, this risk of, of self-aggression. Um, so I hope this is helpful and um, thank you for being here. I'm going to be here, try and be here every Friday. Uh, leave your questions leave your comments and um, I'll talk to you again real soon. Namaste.